So the last speaker in my section is Zhang Kere Mutanguang from IS, IAS. <laughs> he, he will uh, talk to us about canonical forms for free group automorphisms. All right. Uh, thank you to the organize, uh, organizers for this invitation. Uh, I'm happy to tell you about uh, uh, what I've been thinking about on OutFN. And uh, I guess I'll, I will make a disclaimer where uh, I am thinking about finite rank things now. It's not nothing big about what I'm doing. And even worse, uh, or whatever, uh, is I'm not even thinking about out FN in general. I'm just thinking of a single uh, outer automorphism group. So uh, I'm not interested currently on in studying uh, the outer automorphism group as a whole, but just picking one outer automorphism element and trying to understand it. And the thing you should have in mind now is uh, if you are looking at like out of Z to the N of a free abelian group, then that's uh, GLNZ and uh, individual elements are sort of well understood through, let's say, uh, Jordan canonical forms. Uh, if you're looking at uh, mapping class groups, then there's a Nielsen Thurston decomposition of mapping classes that ends up uh, playing a very similar role to uh, the Jordan canonical form. And that works for mapping classes. And uh, I, I've been curious on whether I can develop something very similar for our uh, That's That's the motivation I give people but it wasn't my personal motivation. Uh, if you're interested in why I was personally uh, invested in this, then maybe you can ask me afterwards and I'll chat about it, uh, sort of related to what I did in my thesis. Uh, but this is, I think, a motivation that maybe most people might be able to uh, relate to. So uh, let me first give a theorem uh, that was proven by uh, Thurston. I'm not going to discuss how it was proven or anything like that. Uh, so before you get into the Nielsen test and decomposition, there is one particular class of uh, mapping classes you, you want to point like uh, single out and sort of show that they're uh, special and it turns out they're sort of the generic ones. So most mapping class groups will look like this. All right, uh, so what are they? Uh, I'm going to be interested in compact surfaces uh, very far from brick surfaces. And uh, even I'll restrict myself to those with negative Euler characteristic, which means they admit uh, a hyperbolic metric. And I'm allowing a boundary, uh, I'm allowing non orientable ones. Uh, when I say, oh, I didn't write this down here, but uh, I guess I'll use green. When I think about homeomorphisms, uh, I just really just mean homeomorphisms. So they can be orientation uh, like or reversing, they can permute the boundary components, who cares? It's just a homeomorphism. But I'm interested in these homeomorphisms up to isotopy. And, uh, and so uh, you can classify this mapping classes. So up to isotopy, you can think about infinite order. So that means no power is isotopic to the identity. And irreducible here means no power is isotopic to something that uh, leaves, uh, let's say, a, an essential simple closed curve invariant. All right, uh, so that's something that you could sort of define even though I say it as in terms of F, it's really something of the isotopic class. It's something about the mapping class. And uh, if it's infinite order and irreducible, then Thurston proved that there's a sort of like a very special uh, conclusions you can make about this. And it's actually an if and only if so it characterizes this infinite or, uh, order irreducible homeomorphisms. So he proved that there is a pair of measured transverse lamination, uh, singular uh, foliations. So here's uh, what I mean by mod the boundary component means when, whenever you talk about uh, foliations, in most places you think about it as um, it sort of looks like this. 
horizontal lines and uh, vertical lines. So it looks like a gray, uh, it's like uh, horizontal lines and vertical lines, but you might, you, you, because of the, this uh, negative Euler characteristic restrictions, you'll have some singularities. So you'll have points that look like this. And then if you have boundary, I'm allowing the boundary to also sort of be part of your foliation. So you can have You always have singularities on your foliation, or on your boundary, if there is a boundary. And uh, your foliation looks something like this, All right? So uh, they're transverse except at the boundary. At the boundary, they're actually sort of parallel. They both share the boundary as part of the foliation. All right, so you have uh, these two uh, transverse uh, singular foliations. They are measured, which really means locally you have a notion of distance between the leaves. Uh, that's good enough. And uh, the second uh, condition is that there is something isotopic to G. There's a homeomorphism isotopic to F, I mean, uh, call it G. And there is a stretch factor lambda greater than one. And this homeomorphism G preserves the foliation. So it sends leaves to leaves. So uh, there's a plus leaf and a minus leaf. So it sends the plus leaves to the plus leaves and the minus leaves to the minus leaves. And uh, with respect to this sort of like local uh, distance, it actually multiplies, uh, with respect to the plus distances, it multiplies it by lambda and with respect to the minus distances, it divides by lambda. So it, it sort of looks like a homothety that's stretching by lambda in one direction and uh, shrinking by lambda in the other direction. And uh, if you have such a condition, wait, well, what else? Oh, the third condition is uh, the only loops you can write in, this, uh, in the leaves are the ones coming from the boundary component. So if you have an essential, uh, in an essential simple closed curve, then that's not going to, that's always going to be transverse to your foliations. And if you satisfy one, two, and three, we call that being zero Nasov. If you've never seen the definition before, that's it. And this is not usually mentioned when uh, the Nielsen testing classification is uh, brought up, but there's also a third part, which is that this tuple of the foliation, transverse measure, homeomorphism G and lambda are essentially unique. So there, there's only one tuple satisfying uh, uh, all these conditions one through three. And uh, basically the only changes you can do is sort of uh, rescale the matrix. So you can sort of uh, replace the transverse measure by uh, scalar multiple. And the other thing you can do is uh, conjugate G uh, by a homeomorphism that's isotopic to the identity. And that should also sort of satisfy the same conditions, but that's the only thing you can change to this. All right, so let's see what we can say in the, oops, in the automorphism case. Uh, of a free group, if you have an uh, infinite order irreducible automorphism. So infinite order here again means a power that's not the, an inner automorphism and irreducible means uh, you don't preserve any free factor system after conjugacy. If you like thinking of it in terms of graphs, it means you can't find a graph and represent the automorphism on this graph by a homotopy equivalence that, preser uh, that preserves a proper subgraph that's non-contractible. All right, so in this situation, uh, I'm not going to talk about foliations. It makes no sense because I don't have a, uh, a manifold anymore, but uh, there is an R tree. So an R tree is a geodesic uh, metric space where triangles look like tripods. So the union of two sides contains the third side. And this uh, R tree has an action by F 
uh, F is a finite triangle free group. Uh, I'm not going to use subscripts like Fn. People usually use subscripts for rank. I'm going to use subscripts for in, uh, indexing a bunch of groups. So I'll never indicate a rank, but always remember that it's going to be finite rank, at least two, uh, to keep things uh, simple. Uh, so I'll have an isometric action on an R tree with trivial act stabilizers. This third condition means if you have a non-trivial element that fixes a point, it fixes a unique point. And that's a nice property because usually you end up having like point stabilizers being malnormal. So you can talk about uh, like relative hyperbolic structures if that's what you're interested in. All right, uh, second thing that exists. So this is an existence statement. Uh, there is a homothety of the, of the R tree that sort of sees the automorphism you're interested in here. So what does it mean to be phi equivariant? Being phi equivariant means uh, if you pick a point and an element of the free group, so let's say A is an element of the free group and you pick a point P in your tree and then you apply the uh, hom uh, homothety to it, then uh, this is the same as applying the homothety to P and then acting on it by phi of A. Applying the homothety to P and then acting on it by phi of A. Uh, uh, so in, in a sense, this homothety represents the automorphism. So it, it tells you some things about the dynamics of the automorphism. And it's a homothety where things are stretched by lambda and lambda is greater than one. So this looks a lot like the second condition here where uh, our pseudo Nasov stretched the transverse measure by lambda. Here we have a homothety that trans, uh, stretches uh, distances in our uh, R tree by lambda. And then uh, for the final condition, uh, uh, an element of the free group fixes a point. So we call it elliptic if it fixes a point if and only if its conjugacy class is periodic with respect to the action of the outer automorphism. So it's not the element that's periodic, but it's conjugacy class that's periodic. And then most importantly for us, this tuple is unique. So uh, what, does, uh, what do I mean in this situation? So let's say you had a tuple T prime, D prime, H prime, lambda prime. So I'm going to have my free group acting on T prime, D prime. And this D prime is going to have a phi equivariant lambda prime homothety H prime. And uh, it turns out that if such a thing exists, then if you look at the tree we started with, we constructed earlier, then uh, there is a, uh, an isometry here, but it doesn't, not necessarily an isometry because you might be allowed to rescale. So up to rescaling the metric on D, there is an isometry that's equivariant with respect to the action of F. And uh, it turns out whenever you have such a thing because of the minimality conditions, it's unique. So there is a unique isometry that makes this, uh, that, that's equivalent with respect to the action. And that ends up forcing you to actually conjugate H prime to H, uh, to H. So in a sense, the only thing you can change in this tuple is rescale the metric D. But there is a unique homothetic that makes this work. And there's a unique, uh, tree up to rescaling that makes this whole thing work. And even lambda, like lambda prime ends up e being equal to lambda in this situation. So everything here is essentially unique up to rescaling the metric. Uh, if you doubled in a, a little bit of category theory, you sort of notice that this is a universal construction. Uh, so not only am I proving that things are, uh, unique, they're also unique uniquely. There, there's a unique isomorphism that makes everything match up. So you get a, a universal property and I don't know, 
universal properties are always amazing if you can get them. Any questions about this? All right, so now to, uh, to sort of like, what's, this is all old stuff. Like the, the mapping class stuff is from the 70s. The bisphenol handel theorem is from 96. And what I would really like to do is answer the same question, but without this restriction. Uh, can I do a similar universal construction for any automorphism, not just the infinite order irreducible ones? All right, so in, Thurston did a much more general thing. So he didn't just classify the pseudo Nassos, but he said, even in general, if you have a homeomorphism, uh, if you have a homeomorphism that induces some automorphism on the fundamental group, then uh, there is an action of the fundamental group on an R tree, but this R tree can sort of be decomposed into finitely many subtrees. Uh, roughly speaking, I'm not going to really uh, describe what that means, but I'm going to call such a, a decomposition a factored tree. And uh, your tree has trivial, uh, the action has trivial act stabilizers of, as before. You have a phi equivariant uh, homeomorphism, but this is not a homotheory anymore because you have finitely many subtrees. It's sort of like a, 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 a homotheory with respect to each one, but the stretch. All right, so I was saying if you have a, a homeomorphism and an auto, and you look at the automorphism induced uh, on the fundamental group, then Thurston proved this uh, much more general theorem without any assumption on the homeomorphism. You have a, a tree that can be decomposed into finitely many trees, and uh, you have a, a representative of your automorphism on this tree. That's a homeomorphism that's not exactly a homotheory, but it's a homotheory when you restrict to each subtree. And the stretch factors do depend on the subtree you're looking at. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, the, the, an element in your fundamental group is going to be elliptic if and only if its conjugacy class grows uh, linearly. Or here, this just means it's subquadratic. Uh, it turns out that actually means it's either a constant or so periodic, or it's uh, linear. Uh, those, those are the only two options here. So uh, the tree uh, can separate the linearly, uh, the linearly growing things from the exponentially growing things. It's exponential because of this stretch factor greater than one. And uh, yeah. Uh, so all that, and then uh, there is some form of uniqueness, which is the same as before, but this time uh, you don't have a unique projective class because you sort of are allowed to rescale each of the factors independently. So projectively, what you get is a unique open simplex, a simplex of dimension k minus one, uh, if k is the number of uh, subtrees you have here. So now the naive thing will be to, so, uh, expect the same statement to be true for an automorphism of a free group. Uh, in general, without any assumption on the automorphism, you want there to be a, a, a factored tree with trivial app stabilizers. Uh, you have a homeomorphism that represents the automorphism and it's a, a homotheory, an expanding homotheory with respect to each of the subtrees. And moreover, you want to say that uh, an element is going to be elliptic if and only if it grows, uh, because in general, if you have rank um, R for your free group, you, it is possible to have, like if you have rank three, it is possible to have a quadratic growth, for example. Uh, so here, I just mean it's going to be subcubic, uh, but that's actually a question. We, we're not even sure if this is true. So I put this here as a potential theorem, is uh, can you have a tree which the elliptic elements are exactly the ones that grow uh, uh, polynomially. And then you want it to be unique in the same sense that the Thurston tree was unique. 
And it, it, to really, it turns out this is not entirely true. You want to collapse more than just things that are polynomially growing. And to appreciate that, I'm going to sort of like uh, make a detour here and uh, uh, focus on one example. And this is going to be the main example for the rest of the talk. Let's say you have a free group of rank six generated by A, B, C, D, E, F as your basis. And your automorphism does this. So essentially on A, B, C, D, E, F, it almost looks like the same automorphism. A goes to A, B, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, D, E, F, F, E, F. But I'm doing some uh, prefix, uh, no, suffix. Uh, I'm adding some suffixes to D and E. So D uh, uh, adds a commutator of A and B. So A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And E adds uh, an element of C. And uh, you can represent this automorphism on a rose where the petals are labeled by A, B, C, D, E, F. And the obvious map, I'm going to say it's a train track, but it's not irreducible. And uh, you don't really need to know what these terms mean. Uh, but you should really think these were the conditions that Besvina, Fein, and Dell used to prove their theorem earlier. They, they really needed to have an irreducible train track to prove the theorem. And uh, it, it, it was known at the time that uh, infinite order irreducible automorphisms have irreducible train tracks. But in general, you don't know that these things exist. Irreducible train tracks exist. All right, so now I'm going to stratify the free group and think about F1 as the whole free group, F2 as the, uh, as the free factor generated by A, B, C, D, and then F3 is the even smaller free factor generated by just A and B. And by the definition of my automorphism phi, you can see that uh, F, uh, F2 is invariant under phi and F3 is invariant under phi. So I can look at the restrictions of this automorphism. Okay. Uh, and then uh, an another thing I'm not going to really uh, discuss, discuss uh, in detail is the definition of attracting laminations. But morally, you should want to think of you pick an element that grows exponentially and you iterate it and see what happens. So as you iterate it, it gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And at the limit, you want to have this by infinite words. And those are going to be your collection of uh, so-called lamination. So if you started with A and you iterate it, you end up getting really long segments that are going to have alternating forms of A and B in them. It's not random and it's not periodic. So it's uh, there is sort of, uh, some structure to this, and it's known as a lamination. If you started with D, you're going to see long segments of red portions and also blue portions, A's and B's. But notice that whenever you see A and B, it's always going to be in the form of a commutator of A and B here. And that gives you another lamination that I'm just going to call lambda two and denote in red because it came from D, which was red. And then if you started with E, which is green, and you iterate it, you're going to see long segments of green in it. And you're also going to see long segments of red that look like the red segments you saw uh, when you iterated D. And then you'll also see blue segments in there and the blue segments will also always be com uh, commutators of A and B. So in, in these two laminations, you're never going to see B, A, B, A. Every time you see anything that's blue, it's going to be a commutator of A or a power of it. All right, so now this gives us three laminations. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really glossing over how it's, uh, they're actually defined, but these three laminations are partially ordered by containment uh, in the sense that when I say it in green, whenever you see red portions, you're going to see uh, portions that you saw in lambda two. So in that sense, you can, sort of, uh, you can define lambda two as being contained in lambda one. But lambda three, you'll never see B, A, B, A appear anywhere else. So it's not contained in lambda two, it's not contained in lambda one. And moreover, it's purely blue. So it doesn't contain any of the lambda twos and lambda ones, which are red and green respectively. So 
in this partially ordered set, you just have lambda two uh, contained in lambda one and lambda three sort of independent. And the top ones that are not contained in anything are known as top most attractive laminations. So it turns out this is the really the crucial bit that you need to generalize Thurston's theorem. So that my theorem says, uh, if you start with an automorphism of a free group, there is some tree, an action of a free group on some tree with trivial act stabilizers. That tree decomposes into finitely many subtrees. And you have this homeomorphism that's an expanding uh, homothety on each of the subtrees, and it represents the automorphism. All, everything is exactly as we saw with Thurston's theorem so far. And now, uh, rather than characterize the elliptic things, so the things that fix a point, I'm going to characterize the loxodromic things, which are the things that don't fix a point. And it turns out, uh, in this case, I want the loxodromic things to be the elements that limit to top most attractive laminations. So in our, in our example here, uh, D limits to something that's not topmost, so you won't expect that to be loxodromic, that will be elliptic. On the other hand, uh, A and E, which are elements that are limit to topmost laminations, are going to be loxodromic because they, that's the uh, condition three. And then most importantly, it's unique in the sense that uh, Thurston's tree was unique. Uh, you're going to get a unique simplex of dimension k minus one uh, of projective trees that sort of satisfy this uh, uh, three property. Yeah, I wanted to give a proof, but uh, I'm going to skip this. And uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I guess. Uh, any any questions? Yeah, I actually have a question about the previous example. Could you go to the previous slide? Um, maybe I'm missing something. But why why is lambda three not uh, lower than lambda two? Because you said you always see commutators, but within the commutator, you do see A and B, for instance. Yeah, you, you do. But really, the thing that I kind of glossed over is the containment means I'm going to see arbitrarily long portions of this. So like uh, if lambda 2 were to be contained in lambda 2, I will not just have to see A, B, but I will have to see anything I see here. So I should be able to see B, A, B, A, B in here for lambda three to be contained in lambda two. But wouldn't you, because when you apply that to the, so when you apply the, the automorphism to the commutator of A, B, you should sort of get that, uh, right? No? Uh, no, sorry. So that's the other thing. The commutator is special in this case because it's fixed. So ah. if you uh, apply uh, the automorphism to the commutator, Yes, A is going to see those portions, but there's an A inverse and things are going to cancel out. Ah, okay, okay. And so that's why you only ever see powers of the commutator. But I because see. C is not fixed, that's why lambda two ends up being contained in lambda one. Ah. So here the suffix was something that was fixed and here the suffix was not. And that, that really was the crucial thing that determined whether lambda three is contained in the others or not. Got it. Thank you very, very much. Very good question. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's almost four. So thank you again. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Sorry. <laughs>